All right, good morning, everybody. Let's start with our today's lecture on game AI. And let's uh, try to remember what we have been doing throughout the last couple of times. If you remember, uh, that was a week ago, I guess, I um, presented you with an example of a game map that somewhat looked like this. So this is supposed to be a waypoint graph. Let me quickly finish this waypoint graph so you can see it. And um, yeah, whatever. This is what we looked at two weeks ago. It's supposed to represent a dungeon. I don't know, in some fantasy game, whatever. Every intersection here is supposed to represent a vertex in the waypoint graph. And as always, we do have these uh, neighborhood relations indicated by the edges. And um, we have been studying the problem of path planning. We saw that uh, that can be based on, on waypoint graphs like this. And this is, again, just, you know, an example. And we've been thinking about uh, more efficient ways uh, for path planning. One idea could be to cluster such uh, information, cluster the information available to us in a waypoint graph. Uh, for instance, we can think of every vertex being labeled with its, uh, in this case, two-dimensional coordinates. And uh, if we were to cluster a waypoint graph like this, if everything works well, then maybe every room in this dungeon would actually end up in its own cluster. And if we were to plan a path with the clustered data, then um, the problem of sort of moving from somewhere here to somewhere here could be addressed in terms of planning a path from this room to this room. And like once we have this global uh, idea as to how to move from here to here. In the next step, we could refine this path using sort of the uh, information of the waypoints within each room. That, of course, reduces the effort of all of this. Um, we can do it on the waypoints immediately, but then the fringe is very large. If we do it sort of clustered waypoints, then uh, the uh, first path of the algorithm does not have to compute that much. And then in the second path, we can plan local paths, right? So, and um, one idea that springs to mind is to say, well, let's use k-means clustering. Let's apply k-means clustering to the 2D coordinates assigned to each of the vertices. And then we saw that something strange can and typically will happen in these uh, settings. We found that the uh, k-means clustering algorithm produces four clusters like this, where um, we saw in two actually practical examples that waypoints belonging, say, to this room up here and this room down here uh, had been assigned to the same cluster. And that is, of course, because, say, a waypoint situated here is geometrically much closer to a waypoint up here then, I don't know, to some other waypoint in this room down here, over there, say, right? But this is, of course, very undesirable. Very undesirable because if we were to run k-means, and it would produce solutions like that, well, uh, according to the criterion the k-means algorithm operates on, this is a good solution. But it hardly agrees with our intuition about the problem. And last time we looked into um, reasons as to this behavior of the k-means algorithm and found that k-means clustering is a special case of Gaussian mixture modeling. And uh, that also explains why uh, the clusters we saw in the example uh, two lectures ago were about of equal size. Because remember, the k-means algorithm basically tries to place cluster centroids into the data we are given, in our case two-dimensional location vectors attached to every vertex, places cluster centroids into this data and tries to minimize distances between data points and these cluster centroids. 
And again, like uh, if there's a cluster centroid here, then a point down here will be closer to this one than, um, I don't know, to a cluster center in, in this lower, lower room in this example. Particularly, we saw that the uh, K-means algorithm actually fits a very simplified Gaussian mixture model uh, where it assumes that all of the Gaussians have sort of the same variance uh, structure, covariance structure, right? Now, this is uh, not really desirable. And uh, in the example I presented to you two weeks ago, we actually saw that uh, we can do something about this if we use a different algorithm. In particular, uh, we saw that the idea of spectral clustering was indeed producing four clusters that uh, perfectly matched with the topology of this situation. It identified the four subgraphs that make up these four rooms. Right? And therefore, today we have to look into the idea of spectral clustering and um, that is very interesting uh, I hope it's interesting for you it's definitely interesting for me because if you check out the uh, machine learning and pattern recognition literature uh, that deals with the idea of spectral clustering you usually find that they uh, begin the exposition of this algorithm by saying well, let us consider the Laplacian matrix of the graph. It's a matrix, let's call it L, which is defined as uh, D minus A, where D is uh, the graph degree matrix, and A is the graph adjacency matrix. Okay. Given this definition of the graph Laplacian, uh, what we then do in spectral clustering is to consider the spectral decomposition of the Laplacian, say u times lambda times u transpose. And once we have that, we determine the k eigenvectors of L belonging to the k smallest eigenvalues of L and use those to cluster the graph. To me, this is not acceptable. Right? I, mean, I can do it like this uh, and if I were to do it like this, we'd already be done for today. Uh, but if you remember I don't know, at the very beginning of, of this lecture series, I, I was ranting about what it means to uh, enjoy a university education. And I said that uh, studying is all about learning and that is all about making connections between things you might already know. And learning to transfer things you already know to new areas new applications, new problems. And uh, now it's time for me to eat my own dog food. Right? Because if I claim that university education is about making connections to things you already know, uh, so in order to understand them and to transfer this, now is the perfect opportunity for me to show what that actually means. Right? And that is to say, today we are going to try to understand this idea of the graph Laplacian. Because I sincerely feel that if you have a better idea where this comes from, then you will have a better understanding of what it means to do spectral clustering. Again, usually the literature and, and, and lecture notes and, and books and whatever you, you find out there, they say, well, we consider the graph Laplacian and then we decompose it and here's the result. Nobody, nobody actually gains anything from that. So, let us take a huge step back and 
talk about derivatives, gradients, and divergences today. So our topic for today is understanding understanding the uh, Laplacian. And in order to do this, we have to look at what we know about derivatives, gradients, and uh, divergence. Hmm. And we will do this for the two cases. First, the continuous case and second, the discrete case. And that is to say the first 20 minutes of today's lecture uh, might be really strange to you because it may so happen that I'm just summarizing stuff you know ever since high school. Right? But we'll then have to transfer this knowledge of yours to the case of discrete mathematical functions and from there we can transfer it to graphs. <coughs> so at the beginning, in the interest of time, I will sort of try to make it as fast as possible, right? So, um, let us remember what it means to consider the first derivative of a, a real valued um, univariate continuous function uh, f of x. Right? This is a function that has just a single argument called x, therefore it is univariate. We assume that f takes an argument in the reals and maps it to the reals. In that sense, it is a real function and it is continuous. <coughs> right. Now, if we look at the idea of the first derivative, you remember that when you first learn about this, there is the notion of the derivative from above. And that is to say, we consider a expression, let's call it f plus prime of x, which is defined to be the limiting process where some epsilon becomes very small. And in particular, it is the limiting process where we look at f of x plus this epsilon minus f of x over this epsilon. And this is indeed what it means to derive a function from <coughs> above. This epsilon becomes ever so small, then this will hopefully eventually become the derivative of this function f of x. But we also have to make sure that the derivative from below, which uh, will be written as f minus prime of x, also a limiting process where some epsilon is becoming very small. Uh, this is the derivative from below. So we have f of x minus f of x minus epsilon over epsilon. And maybe you don't even see that when you uh, talk about derivatives, but we will need that today. Uh, not so much in the case of uh, continuous functions, but once we are beginning to talk about discrete functions, uh, it will be very useful <coughs> to remember these two notions for the case of continuous functions. We have the derivative f plus prime of x from above and f minus prime of x from below. 
No. Um, as I said, I mean, you might actually not really ever look into this when you learn about calculus, but these two definitions actually allow us to define what it really means to derive a function. We, uh, namely, we say that a function f of x is differentiable, differentiable <coughs> in a point x naught if these two derivatives from above and from below coincide. Right? That is to say, it is f of x is differentiable if the derivative from above in the point x naught is the same as the derivative from below. If these two things are the same, then we'll actually call this just f prime at x naught. And we also write, uh, we write f prime of x, so the first derivative of the function f of x is often written as d dx <coughs> f of x. And we note that f of x is a function, the unit area is continuous real valued function, then its derivative is nothing but another function say g of x. Right? And of course, uh, well, let's have us briefly look at an example. So, uh, I don't know, here we have x, this is some function. Uh, let's single out some x naught. So, here, this is a smooth function. So, from what we remember from high school or our undergraduate studies, uh, in, in this example, the derivative, you know, this is the function f of x. For this example, the derivative of f of x in x naught from above and from below <coughs> actually do coincide is the same. We all know that it sort of represents the tangent at this point. In a sense, we can understand it as the rate of change. Uh, now, why would it be interesting to actually define uh, differentiability in terms of uh, uh, above uh, differentiation from above and below does coincide? Let's have a look at another example, say this one, and let's call this here x naught. So, what is the derivative of f of x in x naught? It does not exist. Right? It does not exist because this is a in like in the case of the derivative of singularity. If we were to compute all the derivatives coming from below and all the derivatives coming from above, they might have a different value here. Um, so this is this is just a refresher uh, as to what it means that a function that is continuous, again, this is important, is differentiable. Now, uh, another refresher about oops, differentiation. This is actually uh, also interesting for what we are going to, to see today or for the insight that hopefully will pop up at the end of today's lecture. Um, remember or note depending on if you have ever heard of this or not, that this operation, the differentiation of a function, or let's say it's depending on one argument, d dx, is a linear operator. Right. Uh, that is, we have, now, uh, I say this is an operator, that is to say it takes something and does something with whatever it takes as an argument and produces something new. So this is indeed uh, an abstract function, if you want. So d, dx takes 
in our case, a function that maps from the reals to the reals and produces another such function. Right? So this is an operator. It has an input argument and produces an output. And the input and the output are not but numbers, but indeed functions. Okay? Uh, and I said it is linear, and that is to say that if we compute the derivative of a function, let's call it f of x plus another function g of x, we know that this is d dx f of x plus d dx g of x. This is, this is one thing that has to be given for an operation to be called linear. And the other thing is, of course, that if we look at ddx of some constant alpha times the function f of x, then that is the same as alpha times the derivative. So differentiation is an operator and is linear. And uh, just a side note, sometimes uh, instead of say, you know, saying it maps from functions over the reals to functions over the reals, we can also say that this operation of differentiation maps from the set CK to the set CK minus one where CK is supposed to indicate the set of all functions that are K times differentiable. And if we differentiate such a function once, then we map it to the set of all functions that are K minus one times differentiable. Good. Now, ever so quickly, this is the first derivative, um, or the actual derivative operator. Is a linear operator. Let's ever so briefly remind ourselves about the notion of second and higher derivatives. Yeah. And then we are good to go into uh, uncharted territory or like more uncharted territory. So here is the uh, second derivative really make it short. Basically, that is to say, if we compute d squared dx squared of a function f of x, then that is basically to say that we differentiate it twice. Right? And of course, we can have the nth derivative, and that is basically dn dxn f of x this is ddx ddx f of x okay that was um, a very brief and brutal reminder of what is going on with respect to univariate functions now we will generalize this slightly and look at multivariate functions. And that leads us to the notion of the gradient of a multivariate function. So here it is. Gradient of a, again, let's simplify our lives and just consider real values. Like all of this works for the complex uh, numbers as well. Of a real multivariate function. So this is uh, an n-dimensional function <coughs> where we have a function f that depends on one up to m arguments x1 all the way up to xm. I shall also write this as f depending on a vectorial argument where we understand that this vector is n-dimensional 
can see here. And when I said this is a real multivariate function, I tacitly assume that uh, it maps from these n dimensional vectors, then we're going to take them in a different manner, f maps from the m dimensional space to the real numbers. And we already saw something like this. This is nothing but a scalar field. Remember when we talked about the use of potentials in order to control the behavior of game characters, the motion behavior. We indeed already encountered such functions here. Now, the gradient of such a function, I'll write it using this Nabla operator. So we apply this operator to f of x. And that is, uh, and again, I hope you all know that, just a vector where the first component of this vector consists in the derivative of this function f of x with respect to its first argument. Right? And same for the others, and say the mth component of this vector is just the partial derivative of the function f with respect to the last argument. All right. And um, well, then of course we see that this uh, gradient operator is all, uh, it's also an operator, I already called it an operator. This is something that maps from the functions that map from Rm to R. So this is the input argument of the gradient operator. And the output is a function that maps from Rm to Rm. And this is, this is uh, also, if you want to recall what we did when we talked about potential fields uh, in order to control the behavior of game characters, this is a vector field. A vector field. Yeah, and let me ever so briefly just uh, give you an example as to how we can look at these things. So here is an example. Let's consider a 2D case. So say here is a coordinate direction. Let's is it called x1? Yeah, okay. So this is x1 and this is x2. We have some function here, so this is f of x1 and x2. Uh, what is the gradient of this function at some point x? Well, we have to compute the derivative with respect to the first argument. Um, and we see that that, that will become the uh, first element of the uh, gradient, this vector here. And so basically, this is can think of it as this would be the derivative. So this is d dx1, fx1, uh, x2. x2, say times the unit vector pointing along the dimension of x1. And uh, here is the derivative with respect to the second dimension, second argument of the function uh, f, and uh, this vector here is just indicating that it points into the direction of x2. And then, of course, you know, the gradient vector is therefore probably this one. So this is indeed the gradient of f. And some point, let's call it x naught here, x naught. But I hope this is not really new. Okay, we have talked about derivatives and gradients. 
And next thing we have to look into is the notion of the divergence. And we are done with this. So this is, this is the most important one for what we're doing today. The divergence, the divergence of a vector field. And we just saw that a vector field is a function that maps vectors to vectors, well, depending on where we are in this higher dimensional space, we will get a different vector out of that function. Um, so, um, yeah, a vector field, I'll write it like, like so. So this F, see there is, a, is another underscore here. So this is a function that uh, sort of takes a vector as its argument and produces a vector, and therefore this is a vector valued function. Uh, and the divergence of this is the inner product of this Nabla operator with this vector field. And um, we can think of this as basically uh, the inner product of this operator applied to the gradient of some function f of x. Note that this one does not have an underscore. This is a potential, this is a vector field. And uh, this is often written as nabla square applied to f of x, or it has its own name. And this thing is written as triangle f of x. And before I give away the name of this triangle thing, so this is often written like this. And it is defined as the sum where i ranges from 1 up to m over the second partial derivatives. The xi squared. Can you recognize this as the scalar product of the gradient of f mm -hmm. with the Nabla operator? This is, is the sum over all of the components. Uh, we assume that this, uh, this produces an n-dimensional vector. So this is indeed a scalar product. And here is the really interesting thing with respect to our problem of spectral clustering. This thing is called the Laplace operator. Note, this triangle is called the Laplace operator. Again, this is a linear operator. We could easily verify that. Let's not do it. So this is very interesting because uh, We've been talking about the Laplace matrix of a graph. Now we see something that is called the Laplace operator. And that, you know, should raise a, ring a bell or raise an alarm. Uh, hopefully these two things have something in common. Right? Why else would we call this matrix L the graph Laplacian if there is already something called the Laplace operator out there in calculus? And indeed, uh, they have something in common, and this is what this lecture is all about. Once we have understood that, we can move on. Okay, um, where is this used? Um, why would we ever worry about this expression? Like, what, what is the meaning of that, the purpose, the raison d'être? Right? Just ever so briefly, just point out two applications. So um, the Laplace operator is important 
important in uh, studying diffusion waves and dynamics such like like diffusion waves uh, in studying diffusion or wave equations or dynamics this is something we will have to look into uh, again in more detail later on I'm just you know write down some of these equations for instance the heat equation heat equation um, yeah this what, what I've been called F so far in physics they often use U I don't know why it does not really matter and it depends on three spatial coordinates so it has three spatial parameters and there's also a temporal parameter T and the heat equation is given as du dt minus some alpha Laplace u equals zero. So if we were able to solve this equation, then we would have a function u that describes the diffusion of heat in say some plate of metal or whatever. It also appears in the wave equation. That is the one that will keep us busy later on. Here we have the second temporal derivative d square dt square of u minus c square Laplace u equals zero. So both of these things are um, partial differential equations and uh, if you remember that you're faced with the problem of solving partial differential equations it's basically to find functions that comply with these conditions right if you have such a function if you can solve this equation or this equation that basically tells you that here you have found a function that describes the diffusion of heat in some some material i don't know you have something and then you heat it up at some point and then you look at how the heat diffuses throughout that uh, material object and here that would describe uh, a wave I don't know a water uh, electromagnetic wave uh, a wave on the um, uh, string of a guitar and all of these are, are wave uh, phenomena and uh, functions u that comply with with this equation are called wave equations or wave functions and they, they help us understanding these uh, phenomena and this one will come back later but don't worry I'm not you know, this is not a physics lecture we will this this is just to guide our intuition later okay now this was all for the continuous case but our main interest is graphs and graphs are discrete structures in the majority of cases. So we'll have to repeat all of this for the case of discrete functions. So, well, let's, let's go for it. Uh, and we'll do it in the same sequence. First derivative. Derivative of a real, this time, discrete univariate univariate function and I shall write the discrete functions like this right? instead of uh, parentheses I am using squared brackets just to distinguish this as a discrete function from the continuous functions we have been uh, looking at earlier now what, what, what is a discrete function uh, here is an example so here is x. Discrete function, let's picture it like this. I don't know. So this is a discrete function. It is defined at some discrete point, point x. It may take some arbitrary uh, real values, but the domain of the function f 
of x is discrete. Right? And to simplify our lives, it does not have to be this way, but it simplifies our discussion. Uh, let us assume that the domain of this function is indeed the natural numbers. Right? So in this case, I don't know, uh, make it 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on and so forth. And it maps to the rings. Domain is discrete. Okay, so um, then what what are derivatives here? Um, and let me I don't know beautify this picture so that we can have a better comprehension of the difficulty of computing derivatives here. So this is a function of x1 and the reals. Um, now it will actually be very crucial that we have this notion of the derivative from above and from below. Here in the context of discrete functions is often called the forward derivative and the backward derivative, but it's actually the same as uh, derivative from above and from below. So we have the forward derivative. And uh, again, this is often written in, in all of the math books using this uh, triangle, this delta thing. Right? But we have already reserved that for the Laplace operator. So I need a different symbol. Do not be surprised if you don't find that in the math books. Right? But I write the forward derivative as d plus um, 1 of f of x. Usually there is a delta here. Right, in all the math books, you will find the delta, but we use the delta to indicate the Laplace operator. Okay, so I cannot reuse it. That would be too confusing. Um, and this one up here is just to indicate that this is the first derivative. Right. Yeah, we can define that. This is, this is you know, analog to, to the uh, derivative from, from above we, we saw earlier. So we have f of x plus 1 minus f of x divided by x plus 1 minus x. Uh, and this is x minus x is 1. It goes away. We have 1 down here. So we actually do not need the uh, numerators. We basically have f of x plus 1 minus f of x. So this, this is forward discrete differentiation, a backward discrete differentiation is, is very similar. I'll write it like um, d minus first derivative of f of x and again this is just f of x minus f of x minus 1 now we have to divide by x minus x minus 1, but this is again 1. So here we would have f of x minus f of x minus 1. And by looking at this picture, we can already understand why um, it is indeed important this time to really look at the forward and backward differentiation because um, let us single out this point here as a point x0. And the forward differentiation would of course be sort of this line, that is sort of the slope from here to there, right? And the other one would be that line. Remember that I said like for the case of uh, continuous functions, we call it differentiable if the differentiation from above and from below coincide. For discrete functions, we cannot guarantee that. That will basically never happen. Like in general, uh, that will differ. So let me point that out in red. Um, we have the four and backward. And backward derivative of 
a function, a discrete function, f of x in some point x naught will generally generally differ. It does not have to be the case. Function could be, for instance, uh, a constant function, then uh, forward and backward derivative would be the same. But in general, this is not the case. And that immediately leads to a problem if we think about how to define the second derivative of a discrete function. <coughs> so if we look at the problem or task of uh, defining the second derivative, let's, uh, let's consider the forward case. So forward, I write it like d plus 2. And now we see why I've been using a 1. This is to indicate this is the second derivative now of f of x. Well, you know, by transferring what we learned about the continuous functions, then that would suggest that in this case, there's a transfer going on here. Uh, we could define that as d forward differentiation, right? First forward differentiation of f in x plus 1 minus d plus 1 f of x, right? This is, this is uh, you know, computing the second derivative. So the first derivative is you know, computing differences in our case. The second derivative should be differences of first derivatives, all right? Um, we can evaluate that, and I will do so. Um, so, the first derivative of x plus 1 is indeed, uh, bear with me, f of x plus 2 minus f x plus 1. Right, this is just a derivative. Um, and we have to divide that by x plus 2 minus x plus 1. And the first derivative of this here, we already know that this is f x plus 1 minus f of x. That was easy. x plus 1 minus x. Now, can again simplify that. We find that this is f x plus 2 minus 2 times f x plus 1 plus f of x. And similar uh, for the backward case. So backward is similarly, and we basically have put this here. And so anyway, but this is this just you know. Do you see a problem with this? You see a problem. The problem is that we are interested in a derivative at some point, x naught, right? And and this sort of requires us to look fairly far ahead. Not very. Hmm? Not very. Yeah, but but we have yeah, you know, if you do this like the nth times, then you would have x plus n. So to compute the second derivative here, we have to look at something that is x, x naught plus 2 away, minus 2 times something that is x plus 1 away, mm -hmm. plus something here. Yeah. Right, so this sort of requires us to, to consider something that is going on out here. If we were to do it with the backward derivative, it would be reversed. That would require us to look farther back. Does that make sense? Hard to say. Hard to say. Uh, there's no, there's, this is not really a problem from the point of view of uh, abstract algebra, but it is, it is not 
really intuitive, right? So we have a, a problem, which is not really a problem, but we can say it moves away, away from x naught. And therefore, there's like where there's a problem, there is a solution. Solution. But again, let's put it in quotation marks. And the solution is to define the second derivative of a discrete function. And let me first erase this here to avoid confusion. The solution is to define the second derivative as d2. This is uh, you know, d squared, whatever, uh, applied to a discrete function x is, and now um, again careful, d minus 1 applied to x minus d plus 1 applied to x. And if we were to fill in everything we know about these two expressions, we end up with, and I'll just uh, for the sake of time, this is 2 times f at x minus f x minus 1 minus f x plus 1. So by defining the second derivative of this discrete function like so, we see it does not move away from the point we are interested in. Right? It is now somehow centered at the point we are studying. However, this here is highly unconventional. Mm -hmm. I am only doing this because we are really interested in the Laplacian of graphs and uh, in order to not have to deal with funny minus signs later on, I am defining it like this. Yeah? I guess I'm not following. How do you define d1 of fx? Yeah, that was just... Uh, I, I, I did it like a minute ago, so ever so quickly, right? We have d plus 1 f of x is f x plus 1 minus f of x. Yeah, that one, that yeah. part is clear. This yeah. is the second, second yeah, part. Exactly. How do you define the first one? Well, I did it a minute ago. So this is d minus 1 f of x is f of x minus f of x minus 1. But defining the second derivative like this is unconventional. But I have a reason to do it. And the reason is that if we define it like this, for our purpose, in the end, the Laplace operator will pop out automatically. Right? Again, in the textbooks, we usually find the role of d plus and d minus reversed. But that would require us to um, introduce minus signs. And let's keep it like this. But be aware, it is not how it is usually done. OK. Um, with this in mind, it is very easy to extend this to gradients. But before I do so, uh, here is the first thing we can learn today. Or, I don't know, like something that might not be so um, commonly known. Let's see. I have to point out that this creed, I'll put that in parentheses, one-dimensional functions Functions are vectors. And uh, let's just look at an example. Um, so here is a 
discrete function f of x and let's just look at f of x is x squared so we basically have 0 squared over 1 square and I don't know you get the picture it's supposed to be a parabola discrete parabola right um, this function and it continues we may think of it as a vector f so it's a letter f again with an underscore that is given by 0, 1, 4, 9 and it continues on to all infinity and so this is an infinite dimensional vector no problem there sort of like a vector that lives in what is called the Hilbert space but of course like I mean if we have this discrete function and we think of it like this we can collect the values of this function as the entries of a vector not, not really not really uh, something deep going on here I put it in parentheses because this also works for continuous functions but that is a different beast well let's let's look at another example say g of x uh, is but the derivative so let's say the derivative the backward derivative of this function f of x right. we can think of this function as another vector say vector g and uh, this one well we have a slight problem here at zero but let's let's ignore this so the derivative at zero of this function is also zero and we have one three five and so on and so forth this is just sort of the differences here but this is the you know, differentiation of this function the function itself is a vector and its derivative is another function which is another vector and I stress that these derivative operators that, that derive functions are linear operators right, early on and now I stress that linear operators are matrices Linear operators are matrices. So, for instance, to compute this vector g, the derivative, like g is a function which we now understand as a vector, we understand the notion of computing the derivative of a function. Now that we understand the function as a vector, let's see what matrix vector operation actually produces the derivative here. Okay. Whatever. Um, again, if we consider this function f of x is supposed to be x squared, then we saw that this vector is 0, 1, uh, 4, 9, and so on and so forth. And we already saw that the derivative of this function, um, so g of x, is just d minus 1 f of x. Uh, there is something in front of it. Okay. Uh, the derivative was uh, 0, 1, 3, 5, and so on and so forth. And again, this is basically the difference between uh, 1 and 0, 4 and 1, 9 and 4, and so on, 3, 5. So this is the backward derivative. What matrix applied to this vector would produce this vector? Well, first I'll have to put a 1 here. Uh, we first component and now so this is and, and there's lots of zeros here right, so this is basically uh, the first row of this matrix 
times this vector gives this here. Okay, so one times zero, and everything else is zero now, this, this is zero. Um, now we have to apply the second row of this matrix to this vector to get this. And uh, I'll just do it. I'll fill in something minus one and one. And the rest is all zero. More interesting is finally this row here. Um, here we have a zero, a minus one and a one. Zero. And you can take it from there. So this is minus one, one. and so on and so forth. If we apply this matrix with lots of minus ones and ones, minus ones and ones, minus ones and ones, to this vector, we obtain this vector. Right? And this is an example to illustrate my point. Well, first I said these discrete functions are vectors. Now I said that these linear operators are matrices. And here you have it. This is the function, which we now understand as a vector. This is the derivative operator, which we now understand as a matrix. If we apply this matrix to this vector, we get this vector, which is the vectorial representation of the derivative of the function. And of course, uh, this goes on for all eternity, these are infinite dimensional vectors and matrices. But if we were to sort of cut the support of these functions, then uh, we can immediately do that with uh, finite vectors and finite matrices. Okay. We have now seen derivatives of discrete functions, um, univariate functions, we will slightly, slightly extend that, so let's look at the uh, gradient of a discrete, uh, I don't know, multivariate n-dimensional function, and without further ado, this is uh, really not, not worth discussing. Uh, we have the gradient of a function that now is a function uh, whose arguments are vectors, right? several uh, arguments. Uh, and this is basically, let's, let's you know, go for the um, uh, backward derivative one. And I'll write it like this. This is really nasty and nobody ever cares. And I'll tell you in a minute what I'm doing here. Okay. This is basically to say that the gradient of a discrete function that depends on several arguments, x1 up to xn, is given by the vector whose first component is the, in our case here, backward derivative, that is this mean minus, first derivative with respect to the first argument, the mth component of this vector is the backward derivative minus first derivative with respect to the argument m. Uh, this is, is uh, now if we really would have to write it out, we could write it as f of x1 all the way to xm minus uh, f of x1 minus 1 all the way to xm. And this would be f of x1 all the way to xm minus f of x1 all the way to xm minus 1. Right. Not really, not really, um, not really, really so crucial. Here's an example. I'll use it because I'll show you this example because that is the thing that will keep us busy. Say the argument vector x was a two-dimensional vector consisting of two components, x and y. So it's basically talking about discrete functions here, a point in n squared. Then we could have the uh, gradient of f of x 
and y as f of x and y minus f of x minus 1 and y and here we have x of y minus f of x y minus 1 So this, this, is, this is this more abstract thing for the case of uh, two dimensions. Now, um, I have said that discrete univariate functions are vectors. And that was very easy for us to picture. Right? Because these discrete univariate functions are basically functions defined over, I don't know, a discrete domain and we can you mean to sort of like flip the domain to the vertical and we have the vector if you want to. Right? Now I have to claim that multi-dimensional discrete multi-dimensional functions are also vectors. Let's see how that works. And again this also works for continuous functions so we have to be careful And I put it in parentheses. So this creates multivariate functions. Multivariate functions are vectors too. Right. And this is best understood by uh, looking at an example. And again, this also works for continuous functions, but that is really uh, a bigger step. I will happily ignore that. So here, let's you know, look at this claim by means of an example. And we are computer scientists, so we don't have to worry about like mathematical proofs here. Uh, and in particular, let's look at a function of bounded support. Uh, because then things become easier. So we have a function depending on two arguments. So it's like a function defined over a plane and at discrete points in this plane uh, we have a function value. And I said this is supposed to be of bounded support and that means that these two arguments x and y are bounded cannot assume arbitrarily small or large values. And for the sake of simplicity, we say uh, every x has to be greater or equal than zero and less or equal than some number x max. And the same for the y argument has to be greater or equal than zero and less or equal than some y max. Now, then, we can say that this function f of x and y is the same as a vector f. So that is something that has, I don't know, a component f0, f1, some fi, and that continues for all eternity. Well, basically not all eternity because we are talking about bounded support here. Um, and the interesting thing is that we have a, a way of defining a one-to-one -one map between coordinates x and y of the function and components of this vector as follows. I'll just say that i is y times x max plus x. So that the component fi of this vector uh, gives us the value of x and y. Right? If, we, if we use this mapping here to map y and x to a single number i, then the ith component of this vector corresponds to the xy value of this function, the function at coordinates x and y. 
let's look at a more detailed example. And uh, uh, not. Running out of time, but but uh, I guess the example is important. Uh, you can verify that at home. So here is um, the example. Let's look at a function f of x and y. Uh, zero, one, two, three. Zero, one, two. So this this is bounded. Right, the lower limit for x is 0 and the upper limit is 3 and for y we have 2 and 0 and I just put in some numbers 12, 13, 16, 11, 14, whatever, 15 and so on and so forth. Here we have 18. This function, again there is stuff in here I don't really care, corresponds to this vector. Using, using this map between x and y and i, we will find that this two-dimensional function becomes the following vector, uh, 12, 13, 16, 11, and then 14, and so on and so forth, and the last entry will be 18. Okay. Um, I guess we are good for our test. Important thing is not only univariate discrete functions can be thought of as vectors, but indeed these things as well. I mean, like what I did here is I basically took this row and concatenated this row and then concatenated this row, and then it was sort of a linear arrangement. As long as if you have a one-to-one -one mapping between sort of two-dimensional coordinates and one-dimensional coordinates, you're good. And this also works for higher dimensional functions. You can first sort of, if, if that was sort of a three-dimensional function, there is one more coordinate, you can first like take all these slices and concatenate them and then, you know, take these rows out of this very long matrix and concatenate them and then you would have a vector. So in any case, discrete functions can be thought of as vectors. And think about it, what, what does a vector space imply? Uh, it implies that there is the uh, operation of addition. You can add two vectors, gives you another vector. So you can add two functions, gives you another function. You can multiply a function with a uh, scalar, gives you another function. That would work as well. Right? You have uh, um, uh, vector that, that sort of has the uh, property that it does not change the value of the function under addition. You can have that, a function of all zeros, vector of all zeros. Scalar that does not change the value of a function under multiplication would be one. Same for the function. So this is indeed, these functions form a vector space and then why not actually write them as vectors. Okay, uh, ever so quickly now, the divergence of a multivariate function. And then, now we are back to the notation of a discrete, discrete, make it m-dimensional function. Uh, and this is, again, I use the Laplace operator to denote it. And this is, now it's like just defined as in the case of the continuous function. This is the sum, this is the scalar product of the um, gradient of this function with the number operator or written as a sum where i ranges from 1 up to m and then bi second derivative applied to this function x. Here is an example. Example, we again look into the simple case where x, the coordinate, it's a two-dimensional vector xy, 
So if we look at the divergence of f of x and y, we find 2 times f of x and y. This is just uh, using what we just learned about the gradient x minus 1, y minus f of x plus 1, y plus 2 times f of x, y minus f of x, y minus 1, minus f of x and y plus 1. So I have computed the gradient of um, the function f of x and y as I did a couple of whiteboards ago. And uh, then I compute sort of the gradient of that following this inner product here. This is, this is what we get. This is what we get, right? Now we realize that uh, this thing, two times f of x and y, occurs twice. So I will add it. This is basically to say the divergence of this two-dimensional discrete function is given as four times f of x and y minus f x minus 1, y minus f of x plus 1, and y minus f of x, y minus 1, minus f of x and y plus 1. Now, to finally wrap this all up, here is another outrageous claim of mine. A claim that discrete multivariate functions of finite support are labeled graphs. Right. So we are now, this, this, is, this is all, you know, we came from the case of the continuous functions. We saw there are derivatives, there are gradients. There is this notion of the divergence, which plays a crucial role in wave equations and heat dissipation. Uh, then we uh, applied all what we have seen to the case of discrete functions. We already familiarized ourselves with the idea that discrete functions are vectors and that linear operators on discrete functions are matrices. And now I take it yet a step further and I claim that discrete functions of finite or bounded support are labeled graphs and then we are back to the setting we are interested in and finally able to understand the notion of the graph Laplacian. So here is the last outrageous claim for today. Uh, discrete are multivariate, multivariate functions of finite support are labeled graphs. And again, this is best shown by means of an example. We don't have to worry about proving all of this. We need to strengthen our intuition. So let us look at a function f of x and y, um, where again, like this zero, uh, x is bounded from zero to some x max, and y is bounded. Similarly, so this is not defined over all possible values. This function is not defined over all possible values of x and y. But all the x and the y for which this is defined are in the range between 0 and x max or 0 and y max. Right? So basically, if we have this, then, um, I don't know, then this function would be defined at these discrete uh, locations like, like this. Right? So we have a lower bound for the x, we have a lower bound for the y, 
we have an upper bound for the x and an upper bound for the y. Now this function I claim corresponds to a graph g, which is um, I'm going to make it a tree tuple d, e, and a vertex label function, where um, I know. This function corresponds to a graph, g, vertices, edges, and vertex label function, where we have for the set of vertices, this is just the set of tuples x and y, and let's call each such tuple a vertex vi. We already know that this i can be written like that. So that's cool. Um, the set of edges is, is just a subset of the Cartesian product of all vertices and in particular we can look at um, edges like this. Right? and so on and so forth. So basically we can assign edges that would say that uh, this coordinate is a neighbor of this coordinate point, this coordinate, this and that. That's now captured in these edges. And actually we use these neighborhood relations when we looked into derivatives and uh, Laplacians, right? We always had this uh, x minus one, uh, y minus one, x plus one, y plus one. So we already see that uh, what we did implicitly all this time can be understood as something that is captured in the topology of a graph. Right? And this uh, vertex labeling function, this is something that takes a vertex as an argument and produces a real number. And in particular, here we have that the vertex labeling function of vertex vi is exactly the same as, and now things get crazy, like slightly crazy, f at x, where this x is i mod x max, comma y, and this y is i div x max. And if you think of it, and I encourage you to do it, this actually inverts this function. Right? If we're given y and x, we can use this expression to correspond an index i. If we are given the index i, we can compute the x using i modulo x max, and we can compute the coordinate y by i div x max. So this just inverts that. And now we are almost there. Now look at this. So we have we we intuitively see and don't really make that really precise, but these uh, functions f of x and y correspond to labeled graphs. Right? We have this graph structure that somehow gives us neighborhood relations among. Uh, coordinates in this plane, here in this two-dimensional example, and um, the values of the function at some coordinate are sort of captured in by means of the uh, vertex labeling function. So th this is this is indeed another equivalency, if you want. For example, what is like adjacency matrix or something like that? So in adjacency matrix, they're usually uh, the values in the matrix are the yeah, yeah. And, and here we are just taking the label functions value. Yes, um, so we will come back to the adjacency matrix in a second. Uh, what I have done here is I have said we are looking at a discrete function uh, defined over some plane 
right? And at certain discrete locations, and let's see if this was uh, like just the natural numbers along the x-axis and natural numbers along the y-axis, we have uh, values for this function. So this would be f of x and y at some x and y. Right? My original question yep. was, so the relation between vertices is just defined by the labeled function variable? The, the relation between vertices is always defined by the edges. But, but I mean in the matrix itself. Yeah. Uh, there is no matrix here so far. We have a function. There's no matrix on, on this whiteboard. So what we have is a function. Oh, right? okay. Yeah. And this is a function and it's of bounded support. But this function can be thought of as a labeled graph where okay, okay, the okay. vertices correspond to the coordinates of the uh, points where the function is defined. The edges of the graph indicate neighborhood relations between coordinates. And the values of the function are moved into the vertex labeling function. Right, so we say that the uh, vertex i has the value of function f at x and y, where this x is i modulo x max and this y is i with x max. I just mis misinterpret the, the green on the right. Yeah, was, you're thinking. not entirely wrong. It will be a matrix in a second. But not yet. Not yet. So, um, but now we have an equality sign an equal sign between the vertex labeling function and this function f. And I said discrete functions like that are vectors. So accordingly, the vertex labeling function is also a vector. And let me just write it like vector v. Okay, now, Previously, we have been talking about um, this notion of the adjacency matrix. So, adjacency matrix A of a graph G, and we saw that the IJ entry, or maybe I should actually call it, I uh, don't know, make it IJ. Um, of this matrix is given by a 1 if the edge from vertex vi to vertex vj is uh, defined or there is an edge and it is 0 otherwise right and so for um, I don't know this this simple example which we have uh, previously, where we have um, zero, one, two, zero, one, two, three. For for this uh, function that was defined on this interval, we had I don't know vertex v uh, zero. V1, V2, uh, now we can understand these things as labeled vertices, so make it V3, V4, V5, V6, V7, V8, V9, V10, V11. So for instance, looking at this, understanding this as a labeled graph now, as you know, sort of the, the grid thing is the function and now I have inserted vertices and here are their edges um, we see that uh, vertex v6 for instance has four neighbors and now of course these are like uh, these four coordinates in this two-dimensional grid but with respect to the vertex numbers they are uh, vertex 5 10 2 and 7 so in the corresponding adjacency matrix um, of this thing, let me uh, just add it so briefly. We would have an adjacency matrix. Uh, these are 12 vertices, 
four times three, and they are called uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And here we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on and so forth. So vertex zero is uh, not a neighbor of itself, but is a neighbor of vertex one. So there is a one here, and is also a neighbor of vertex four. So there is a one here, right? Uh, vertex one is a neighbor of zero, of two, and of five. And these are the vertices sort of at the boundary of this graph or at the boundary of the um, domain of this function. The interesting one is vertex six because that one again is a neighbor of uh, two, it is a neighbor of uh, five, it is a neighbor of seven, and a neighbor of 10. So in general for like grid graphs such as this one, um, most of the uh, rows of the adjacency matrix will contain four ones. Because most of the vertices, like not in this simple example, but usually if that was a huge grid, most of the vertices would have four neighbors. Um, and now remember that a couple of lectures ago we talked about the notion of the degree of a vertex. So here we would have that the degree of vertex 6 is 4. Right? Because it has four neighbors or four edges incident to it. And um, now, remember that this Laplace operator, uh, this example of the Laplace operator on this uh, two-dimensional uh, function, so this um, v of x, f of x and y, was four times f of x and y minus and then like lots of things have been uh, subtracted here. So there was a four here. There is a four there. And this is, this is uh, very interesting. And actually there were um, a couple of things that were subtracted here. And indeed it was four terms. Right? We subtracted f of x minus one comma y and we subtracted x of f of x plus one comma y. We subtracted thirdly f of x comma y minus one and fourthly uh, f of x comma y plus one. But these are again like the four neighbors. Uh, this is x minus one comma y. This would be x plus one comma y. Uh, the x coordinate remains the same y minus one and y plus one. So, therefore, indeed, we can understand, and this, this is um, the Laplace operator, Laplace operator on this two-dimensional discrete function f of x and y corresponds, corresponds to a matrix, a matrix operation on this vertex label vector V. But this function corresponds to this vector. And if we compute the uh, Laplace operator of this function, this is just again a linear operation on, on a function. This is a matrix applied to a vector. And this matrix, this matrix is the one we have seen at the very beginning of today's lecture when I said it is not acceptable to just write it down. So we continue up here. Um, that is the graph Laplacian is the matrix L which is defined as a matrix D minus the adjacency matrix A. Um, and I said it earlier, like this uh, matrix D is the degree matrix. So where A is the 
adjacency matrix and D is the so-called degree matrix. In particular, we have that Dij, so entry Ij of matrix D is either the degree of vertex Vi if I equals J <coughs> or it is zero. Now once again, in this matrix D, this is basically along the diagonal, where I equals J, we collect the degree of the vertices. Typically that is four for these grid graphs. For the vertices on the boundary of the graph or the um, borders of the interval of where the function is defined, this is, uh, for instance, zero has a degree of two, one has a degree of three, but like in general, and if this is really, really large, it's a large grid, then most of the vertices will have a degree of 4, as it occurred in our definition of the Laplace operator of a two-dimensional discrete function. And um, we have four times, say, the value at this coordinate, minus this value, minus this value, minus this value, minus this value. Right? So this thing would have four neighbors, but this is captured in the adjacency matrix. These are the four adjacent vertices of, uh, say, this, this point here, or this vertex 6. So, if we have degree of 4 minus 4 other things, minus the value of 4 neighbors, well, then we can express that indeed as the degree matrix minus the adjacency matrix times the labor vector. So, that is to say that... So, um, what, what I'm trying to hit home is the following, that the Laplace operator applied to a function f of x and y is exactly the same as this matrix L applied to this vertex label vector. Right. And to wrap it all up, um, and for the sake of time, I am not writing it down, but just saying it. We arrived at this point by looking at discrete functions defined on sort of equally spaced grids. But the concept of the graph Laplacian is not restricted to graphs like this. Right? It is not restricted to grid graphs. Um, this can be computed, the degree matrix of a graph can be computed sort of for any graph. There can be a vertex with 15 neighbors and one with two. Uh, it doesn't matter, we can compute the degrees of all the vertices. And we can always compute the adjacency matrix of a graph, whether one vertex has 15 neighbors and the other has three, does not matter. So this idea of the graph Laplacian actually is more general than, it, than that it would just apply to these grid graphs, which we saw are uh, just other representations of discrete functions. Right? But again, the interesting thing is that we do know what this thing does. Now we understand this matrix L indeed as a realization of this Laplace operator. And this Laplace operator plays an extremely important role when it comes to solving diffusion problems, like how does something spread, or when it comes to solving uh, wave functions or wave problems, like, uh, I don't know, what, what kind of things have the same dynamic as, other, as, as others. Like what goes up, if something goes up, which, which things go, go up as well, which things go down as well. Right? We now understand the Laplacian matrix as the representation of this operation on graphs. And it doesn't have to be a grid graph. And so uh, now that we understand the Laplacian matrix, next time we can then look into why the spectral decomposition of that matrix would actually give us
uh, 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 useful clustering of the waypoint map we have been looking at. Oh, that is all for today. Are there any questions? Great. If not, then uh, we see each other again next week because Thursday is a holiday. Bye.